Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Episode 28, Self-Determination Theory. Okay, so thanks for joining us. Um, so self-determination theory is a topic that is super interesting through the lens of being a music teacher um, or a musician, actually. So I'll give a basic overview of what we'll talk about. And Eric, I'm going to love to hear your perspective on a lot of these ideas as we go through here. The basic, the basic theory is that um, it's, a, it's a framework for how people are motivated to do things. And one of the main tenets of the theory is that there's a difference between being intrinsically motivated to do something and being externally motivated. So being pressured or coerced into doing something with rewards or even punishments versus having a natural interest in doing an activity. And there's a spectrum here. It's not like an absolute black and white. Um, and we'll get into more of this. But this is really relevant for musicians because how many musicians do we know that are in situations like they want to practice, they want the benefits of practicing, but they don't necessarily want to go through the process of practicing itself we've all seen people uh like this throughout our lives and many of us have probably been in that situation in our life um but so this is one kind of arm to the theory the the second arm that's probably like the most important kind of framework of the theory is that we have these three they call them they describe them as psychological needs um to help us both be intrinsically motivated to do something or be more on that side of the spectrum. And also these psychological kind of uh, nutrients will, will make you feel mentally healthy when you're in an environment that helps provide these things. So the really, the three basic psychological needs that they describe in self-determination theory are your need for autonomy. So your need to feel like you can make choices and direct the course of action you're taking. And we'll get into how this plays into the context of being a musician, but that's one of the needs. The second one is your need to be competent. So you have a need to be effective in the environment that you're in. So as musicians, you know, this would be like you have a need to, to actually feel musically competent and effective at whatever it is, practicing or learning. Uh, and the, the third need is relatedness. You have a need uh, or people have needs of generally feeling like they're in significant relationships with people, like they have meaningful communication with people and they feel uh, respected and valued and connected to people. And if these three needs are met, um, people will tend to be more intrinsically motivated at whatever the domain is or whatever the subject is. Um, and they also tend to, to feel subjectively better. They feel more well-being. Um, but it's funny thinking about this over the past couple of years, because if I look back on my own musical upbringing, uh, it's not a surprise why it kind of worked because it provided all of these things. Uh, and so like, you know, we talk about it, uh, with learning music as whether it's a teacher or whether a musician, if we go through each of these, we can kind of tear them apart, but the importance of being intrinsically motivated. I mean, you bring this up to me all the time. We talk about, you know, we're talking about all these techniques for teaching, all these things we can do to like optimize our, our curriculum or, or help students be more engaged. But you always throw this caveat in of like, well, there's some people who are just like on their own, very intrinsically motivated to study music. But I'd love to hear your own thoughts on seeing that throughout the years uh, as a music teacher or even just as a musician yourself. Like we've all run into these musicians who are like a freight train of interests in what they do. And you can see how important that is. Yeah, I, I, it comes up mostly when I'm talking to parents because they want their kids at three or four or five year old to start taking a lesson. I said, mm -hmm. you know, they could play around on, a, on an instrument even earlier from birth to two or three and just goof around but, or, mo you know, tell the parents to model the behaviors. And then the kid just like learns an environment where that's one of the things that humans do. Mm -hmm. versus it being a coercive or controlling environment versus that's really like kind of pressure not, right versus you know we're now going to a music school class and this is where you're going to learn music and you're there you know an hour a week or two hours a week mm -hmm. if you do 
you know, a music theory class, and then the next class is your instrument, and you're four years old, and you know, mm-hmm. and you, uh, you know, having, you know, is it a fight to get the kid to go to lessons, or is it the kind of family where it's already set up, where you you've got discipline in that family, and this is just the way things go, mm-hmm. and and it, it takes away the the child's uh, motivation. Uh, potentially, you know, the, 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 their, their help in making the choice, it takes that away. Because the ch- yeah. ch- children, when they get to be six, seven years old, might be a little bit early, but by eight, you know, the child can really help inform a parent's decision for lessons. Uh, like, I, I, I agree. And I think there's enough research in self-determination theory to show that on the, on the autonomy leg of the theory, I mean, you have this tripod of autonomy yep. competence and relatedness on the autonomy leg basically um whenever you can introduce autonomy into the lesson it it's psychologically and educationally very valid to do so and i think one of the great uh, examples of that in an mlt world is allowing students to choose an imp- instrument that they prefer the timbre uh, yep so i mean big surprise yes you have a someone playing an instrument they prefer the sound of, they tend to perform better in a musical environment when you give them that choice. Yeah, that is the the biggest factor next to their music aptitude is how, whether you stick with something, I think. I, I don't remember mm. the, it act, actually, but I have the instrumental timbre preference measure. Yeah. Or they call it a test um, where you listen to... Yeah, I don't know if test is the right... Well, it, that's what it calls test it. Test sounds like you could get it wrong. Well, <laughs> it's a test to see if you have a strong preference, a strong dispreference, yeah. or no really, uh, no real uh, preference. But, uh, yeah, if you hear this one instrument, I think it's paired with seven other instruments. <laughs> okay. Across... The the scope of the test, and, so, and sometimes it's A, B, sometimes it's B, A. Okay. So there's a okay. take out the order effect. and uh, Yeah, that's probably wise. Right? So, but the timbre preference measure is just computerized sounds that represent the timbre of certain instruments. Because if they were the real sounds of those instruments, right, then... Mm-hmm then uh, you would recognize them and choose them because they're shiny or they sound, they, they look good on MTV videos. I'm dating myself now. You know, the sax- yeah. saxophone's yeah. more representative of band instruments like that. But then mm-hmm. there's the saxophone and the French horn, is it? No. French horn, baritone are the same instrument. There's no difference. And... Uh, String, t- string, the- strings are not represented. Yeah, and then of course percussion, not represented on yeah. that. Uh, on that, but if you've got a a strong preference for flute and clarinet and trumpet combined mm-hmm. compared to other low instruments, you would encourage a child to pick something that's, you know, just a treble clef instrument. Uh, yeah, yeah, and th- and and I do feel like this ties into something that's tangential to this in uh, in terms of letting people play more than one instrument i mean it's it's really amazing how many of my students are surprised when i'm so encouraging to play more instruments you know fight you should be playing the drums and singing and if you like it whatever else you can get in there yeah because i find a lot of people do well with playing more than one instrument and you know if you look at this through this autonomy lens i mean i was never told we i've talked about this a lot on the podcast we just had a piano in the house. Yep. And I, I knew what the, the names of the keys were because someone showed me how to do that when I was young. So every time I learned something on the guitar, I was like, well, on the guitar, it goes A, B, C, D, E. Here's, here it is on the piano. And I just slowly started linking the two together in my mind. But there was never this pressure to make the piano into something like serious yep. with a capital S. It was yep. just there. You know, it was yeah. just a toy. So back to this intrinsic motivation is one of the factors that I always talk to parents about, you know, if the child's musically ready and the child has this intrinsic motivation in addition to, you know, the physical coordination, a psychological readiness, you know, there's certain factors. And then, uh, 
and you don't need all of them, but if you have most of them, you know, um, sure. you know, one of the famous examples, and I think we've already said, Yo-Yo Ma wanted a bass when he was little. He wanted the bass. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, you got to start with violin. They gave him the violin and he didn't like it. And eventually they compromised and gave him the cello. So mm -hmm. uh, who knows what would have happened, <laughs> you know, but that's his story about himself. I mean, that is really interesting to think about the fact that he was at that age. And people do show this at a really young age. They, they, they will try to make choices. And now this often shows up in the eyes of parents as rebellion. But I don't really think it is. I think it's just this natural tendency or proclivity we have to making choices about what we do. We like directing things uh, in our life. Yeah, I, you know, I remember feeling literally struck by lightning, you know, not literally, but it was a really profound moment when I heard a trumpet fill the auditorium, yeah. and it was directed to me as, here are your choices. And so he played clarinets and played saxophones and played trumpets, and I went, oh, wow, boom, you know, just boom, that's the one. You know, it was the, and it was the third grade, the end of the year, kind of thing that, you know, band teachers do and they brought uh, you know a person that played all the instruments and that's what i had in i had that in grade seven that i had that and uh yeah it's like trumpet that's absolutely it and i already had a year on piano so okay i was good at something already before i put the trumpet to my lip not good at but i already knew the basics and i could do you know 10 fingers and not three okay. and four lines and not one. Sure. <laughs> kind of thing. So, or at least two melodies at the same time or whatever, you know, these yeah. tiny little Schumann pieces were or whatever they were, you know, eight measure long. So you had that, you had that experience so, of choice really early on with choosing. The well, trumpet. my brother started piano lessons and I said, why am I not getting piano lessons? Oh, interesting. Okay. I was like, I, why am I not getting piano lessons? He started piano lessons. Why am I not getting them? That's the first mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> and I remember them actually bringing the piano through the front door of the really? house. Yeah. And all this, I all this commotion. That. There were people coming in, you know, my house. This is my house. I was six years old or whatever. Yeah. I mean, getting a piano into a house can be a big deal. This is just a, a big upright. Really, really wonderful instrument. Light action. I, I enjoyed it. My friend has it now. He's keeping it. Well, cool. Until, but, uh, um, but so there's this magic a little bit for me that I already had, probably based in my early childhood experiences like that. But uh, I'm, I'm definitely determining for myself or, or having some strong, you know, ask of my parents, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, of course, by the time you get to, you know, the age where you can start an instrument, yeah, take an instrument, they were all encouraging for that. And then I was always one of the better of the group from then all the way through high school. When I got to college, I found a couple people that were pretty, pretty much better than me in a few different things. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't. I mean, that, I mean, that actually is is part of this theory as well, and it's it's not so much a social comparison aspect of competence; it's your own enjoyment of the success you feel when you are achieving at the task you're trying to do. So, if you're yeah. practicing, you know, you're musically achieving something in the moment, not not some distant goal. You're actually accomplishing something as you're engaged in the activity. Um, but I think that often shows up musically for people as when they take music in school they f they find themselves excelling like to a high degree compared to the people around them yeah uh well my brother was good at everything and i was better at music than he was eventually that showed up so <laughs> i had to outdo him is that part of the theory i mean it's <laughs> social so in general, in general, I think the theory has shown that um, competition in a lot of senses can be negative to people's intrinsic motivation. But what's interesting about this is that competition could actually make you strive more to um, 
practice or do whatever train uh, but in in general it's been shown to not foster intrinsic motivation so your behavior my, can yeah my one of my basic emotional makeups is i'm still not good enough i'll never be good enough for myself yeah you know like like deep, but but there is a under. side of comp- there is a side of competition um and no doubt you you've probably experienced this where there's like a good sportsmanship between people where it's like i like the competition because it, it i like the relatedness of being involved in in this competition with somebody else they're helping me bring out the best that i have in myself and there's this emphasis on like we're both helping each other be better through the competition and that yeah, yeah. even even when you hear that it it just feels different it feels more wholesome in in a sense it's not like i'm going to cheat and steal until i beat this person you know no matter what it's it's actually it's an honoring of the competition to help you guys challenge each other and bring more and i think yeah. in that lens the competition's probably very helpful yeah yeah i'm always just pleased that somebody invites me to play sure you know I, you know out of the blue or you know i've got another gig that came up uh mm-hmm. and we'll see if we can get the rest of the band together i think we need a I think we need a bass player and a keyboard, and then we're set. Yeah, those are, I've jumped in on those roles a lot. <laughs> so the bass player roles, you know. So we'll we'll see, you know. And the other, the thing about it is that the music is is really ridiculous for a trumpet player, you know. It's stuff like Chicago, and oh, yeah. some other stuff where there's some really really choice trumpet parts where you really kind of need to be in shape. For them and yeah, so that I mean, challenge drives me uh you know because you're going to be in front of an audience and i want to you know make the band happy and i also want to you know all the all the all the ladies to come up and swoon and <laughs> i mean you you are essentially <laughs> describing the importance of the relatedness piece of the activity and i i find a lot of people are surprised when they hear this but if you read about mozart you know his composing was done through the lens of it being performed you know, he wasn't, I'm sure he would have yeah. composed for its own enjoyment, but he was actually gearing this all towards it being performed. And I mean, it just makes so so much sense when you view it through this lens that feeling like what you're doing is being, whether consumed by a marketplace or has something to do with another human being, yeah. it tends to foster this natural it's interest. W- it's what made him put all the silliness in his music when he was silly, <laughs> you know, because yeah. some of it, some of his choices are just outlandish at times sure curveballs yeah, I mean, and the he, like yeah yeah exactly so, so i mean so that's one lens you can look at this through um we we dove into a few things there but the autonomy lens there's a lot of different aspects of being a music teacher and and guiding yourself as a as a music as a musician yourself but i mean the one thing that i've seen with autonomy and we've talked this we've talked about this before is allowing students um are again just to restate something we state all the time the contexts that eric and i teach in are very different and i'm often teaching 10 to 17 year olds to play guitar that's my kind of meat and potatoes and, and piano but uh the context is different you know we're teach- i'm teaching one-on-one eric's usually usually teaching in a group and i'm not teaching in groups but one thing that i found that's so important for keeping students motivated and interested in the lessons is letting them choose the repertoire. Not that you don't ever give them suggestions by any means. You're often giving suggestions and saying you should check this out or check that out. But um, to me, it, it's such an obvious thing to do in lessons that it, r- it really just supports people to to play the band they're interested in, the genre they're interested in. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine um, not having that as part of the, the instrumental lessons that I teach. And I think that's why I was often resistant to taking piano lessons when I was younger, mm-hmm. because it, it felt very top down in terms of the repertoire that was oh, being yeah. played. And oh, I, did, yeah. I wanted none of that. I think a lot of it still is. I think that most piano teachers got so much um, thrill out of playing, you know, Schubert and Beethoven and, and Clementi. It's just stuff that was fun for them. All the, traditional repertoire and then you get up to Rachmaninoff and you just sure. right yeah. all, all there's a, there's so much great music that can be played on one instrument you know can you imagine oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it it's, and then and then to reach the height of you know Brahms or name name somebody else. It, there's there's so yeah. many. Um, well, pianos. There's no shortage of <laughs> amazing composers. No, it's it's insane. Uh, 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 wh why wouldn't you want to steer children to reach those heights? Uh, sure. And sure. I think I think at least from what I can gather, that repertoire is still kind of like held a little bit sacred. Uh, yeah. Relative yeah, to playing other types of piano. Um, but you know, yep. where, where's the, like the, like just the Ray this Charles or the issue. Stevie Wonder kind of yeah. pianists who are brilliant musicians, but their chops on the, on the piano. Well, perfectly, and a lot of this isn't perfectly, a problem once you, yeah, perfectly great I mean, for the style and what they need, but it's, it's not, it's not yeah. a, uh, <laughs> who's the guy I'm trying to think of, um, the most renowned stellar pianist probably of all time oh i have no idea i mean and composer thinking, yeah. oh and composer <laughs> yeah if you're thinking piano player i'm thinking glenn gould but yeah no i'm thinking uh, composer uh oh come on list right. oh yeah yeah so franz list is just maybe the sickest of that kind and then art tatum see i i'd i'd yeah <laughs> Yeah. Put those two in a bucket and learn both of them. Yeah, and I mean, there's no doubt that certain teachers have certain skill sets. Like, some teachers are renowned for being Bach interpreters. And so if, if you go to study with them, I mean, maybe maybe take them for what they're worth, right? But in another sense, you know, a lot of these things aren't issues in terms of repertoire choice. When you are, if you've played a lot of different genres and you have a lot of skill playing jazz, jazz music and Latin music and classical music of all kinds, then at a certain point you can kind of like, well, I can just teach myself whatever I want to learn and I can get into stuff. But for when we're talking about guiding beginner students, a lot of teachers have very, like, I would call them, they're beyond structured curriculums. They are suffocating curriculums in terms of there's no wiggle room for extra repertoire. And I, and I don't think that's necessarily helpful. For people and this is part of uh, the conversation that comes out of this self-determination theory is that there's a big difference between structure and and autonomy so like i can you can have a curriculum that's very structured in terms of its educational goals and the repertoire but produce the lessons in a way that are very autonomy supportive so if the kids like one song a lot you might sing it more that day you know, if, the, if they're not so much into another song, well, let's just like move along from this. And they might have some choice, like, what are we going to do next? So that's done in a very autonomy supportive way. It doesn't mean that you're just letting the curriculum be chaotic and just do whatever it wants. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the repertoire's choice is such a big thing for people. Um, even, even for myself in my practice sessions, I practice a lot. And I think that's something that's always kind of encouraged me to practice a lot is that I'm never really, I'm never trying to tyrannically tell myself, like, I have to play a lot of Bach. I have to, <laughs> just because that's what it means to be a classical guitarist today. It's like, well, if I like, if I'm into Bach right now, let's go. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of have tos that are suspicious. Yeah. Uh, right. Should are the enemy of, of proficiency. I should. Yeah. And that, and that's actually a way that's an autonomy supportive technique is that if you were telling someone, OK, we're going to sing the tonal patterns and they're like, well, why? I don't want to sing. Actually giving people rationales for what you're doing and why you're doing it tends to increase their perceived level of autonomy support, which is actually not surprising because you would demand the same out of your friends. You know, if your friend was like, no, we're doing this this way uh, while you go out for dinner and it was making things more difficult for you, you'd probably want to know, well, why are we doing it? Yeah. You know, well, the, the, they're, now that it opens up the box for the range of people that are out there um, that don't need the social interaction. They're, um, mm -hmm. the, um, my brother-in-law would practice all of the Beethoven sonatas, and they were just really difficult for me to listen to because he was just pretending to play them uh, okay. at, at tempo and all the different right it was 
it was but it filled the need for him so you know to to have control over something cuz he had needs that felt way outside you know normal needs <laughs> for people and sure. it, and eventually he had a, he just quit you know not I, this is all on his own he never took lessons as far as i remember okay I mean, as far as I know him, you know, for 30 years, I didn't, so, um, I didn't ever see him practice. It was always just yeah. play through pieces. Uh, oh, yeah. And, I mean, and yeah. it served a need, and he didn't need to have somebody, you know, he need, didn't need to perform for anybody. He, yeah, I mean, but that that is another part of, um you know, this whole framework for looking at things is that someone might actually be getting their related to this needs in a different part of their life than their music practice. Right. And I see this in students and especially, um, students that I've known for a while because they open up to you, but some students really are taking advantage in the lesson of this kind of social situation that you're yes, in. You yes. can, you can see they they need that time for part of their well being, but other students, they're just like, I just want to know, like, how many times do I play this before yeah. I move on? Yeah. I, and it's it's useful to recognize that in a lesson when... Sure, absolutely. I just wanted to make a point for the case of the person that's not on the spec or is, is on the ends of a, of a spectrum somewhere, that, that these things can adapt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But in general, um, the, the, the self-determination theory makes, uh, makes a good amount of sense. It, Sounds it lovely. really explains like my own upbringing as a musician. I mean, my first exposure with music, it was all just random exposure to to singing and dancing and, you know, daycares and all these young kid things my mom had us in. But I've said this before on the podcast, my stepdad had this giant stereo with all these CDs just exposed. And it was just like being in a candy store. Like, ooh, I wonder what this yeah. sound this one makes. And yeah. that was my experience. And I actually did that for years before I ever... Um, Thought about playing an instrument. I didn't, it didn't even enter my mind like I could make these sounds. It was just like <laughs> that's funny. The CD. I wonder. I wonder what sound this one makes. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. And I remember being very gripped by this. Um, like it's all one flavor. <laughs> and then later on, you know, in high school, um, I've said this before on the podcast too. But we had a really good guitar department at our school. The 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 guitar teacher. He was a band teacher, but he was, um, you know, trained as a classical guitarist. But he just made this really good community of guitarists. So I was already very intrinsically motivated to practice on my own. I was listening to tons of music. And then you enter this community of like, this guy has made this huge classical guitar program where we're playing jazz on the side and, and all that. And it just, it just makes it very enjoyable to be a part, to be a musician because, you know, it's serving the social need that you have to hang out with people that are that are having great conversations and you know that's part of why we have the podcast i think which is funny to think but it's one of the reasons i think we like talking about this is it's it's fun for eric and i to riff on this but it's also fun to sh send it out in the world and and make a bigger conversation um but for me that i think was a very important part of uh uh getting more interested in being a musician i i, I have a strong feeling i would have if there were no band program at the school, I would have just kept playing guitar the whole time. But it's hard for me to imagine it getting kind of escalated to the intensity that it did, you know, where I was spending most of the day practicing. Um, and I think this this is an interesting thing to think about with yourself as, as a musician. Like Eric, you said once in a while you play gigs and you get excited to do so. I think a lot of uh, musicians, once they leave university, they stop playing with groups to a large degree. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do. And I think... If you are feeling like, you know, it might be wise to do some reflection about your own, whether it's your students or yourself as a musician, thinking like, okay, well, I'm probably a good musician. If, you know, if I'm listening to this MLT podcast, we'll get into that. But, <laughs> you know, you're probably a decent musician and you probably want to be a musician if you've chosen this to be a career. Uh, very few people will force you to be a music teacher in the same way that you'll be forced to be a doctor. So it's probably been autonomously chosen. And the last thing is like, where are you with the relatedness? And I found that, you know, with musicians, 
it might just be simple something simple as like joining a band where you see these people once every two weeks or once every week or as a teacher especially like do you have other teachers you can talk to because that can be very that's tough and alienating schools. yeah because we teach one-on-one or we, we, we sorry not one-on-one we teach with um we're on our own as teachers typically teaching students and so i do think we have this need to be around other teachers and i found that i've enjoyed teaching i don't know how you quantify this but a lot more since having discussions with other music teachers it makes the job more interesting you know you feel more supported in uh what you're doing and not it's not like eric's giving me specific pointers like maybe try doing these tonal patterns this way it's just this general feeling of it's just this general feeling of like support it's like well i could go to him and ask questions or like we could talk about something that i noticed and uh yeah i think as teachers that's a big it's a big deal yeah i would um, tell band teachers and music teachers in schools and and even pe- people that don't teach don't have groups that, that that they play with each other you know get together and play like not necessarily talk music education but play Mm -hmm. Um, but also the other that's why these professional development things you all the music teachers in one room for a whole district or county or or area or whatever and you all get together they never get anything done because everybody's there interested in just schmoozing let us just you know you know catch up with each other because they're lonely from an educator standpoint yeah, I think so. And I, I, I think it's useful to, like I was saying, just maybe reflect on that from time to time and take stock of, you know, does this act aspect of my life need more relatedness involved into it? Because there's a point where I think for a lot of people, no matter how good you are as a teacher, um, you could get better and better and better skill wise, but you'll still have this need to kind of dialogue with the community. And, and um, like you can't you can't satisfy one need by by over satisfying yeah. another parent education nights i find really valuable where i just you know talk to parents about mostly it's letting the parents tell you how much their kid just enjoys you know they they just want to say that personally to you um sure and sometimes uh you know another, another thing that comes to mind is just if you're a piano teacher you're secluded you don't teach with other piano teachers well find one in your area and get together and yeah. play these you know you know these uh pieces for two pianos you know yeah i know i know that's or something four like, hands um, on one piano whatever um yeah yeah get together and, yeah, and I, do that um uh, as a possibility because that can you know start to give them same things you and i are benefiting from you know just from these conversations you just feel supported and it makes me think a little deeper uh, when we have these conversations so that when i go to the classroom like there might be something that triggers in my brain that wouldn't have triggered without it. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that's one of the reasons why people do well in university when they don't even necessarily need the knowledge that the university is teaching anymore. They'd really just want to be around the the culture uh, of people. And I've often thought about it. Yeah. That's the best part of college is is your community. The the, the ones you like really, you know, fight with like, get down to the nitty gritty of some of these, not only fight, you know, like really tear things apart and discuss and come Mm -hmm. to a better understanding through the dialogue that we're having, the the disagreement and different perspectives and all that is so valuable to learn about yourself and, Mm -hmm. um, and to develop inside the context of, you know, becoming a better music educator, which was always my crowd. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, there was some interesting research I was reading about in the self-determination theory arena about, um, being supportive towards people supporting their autonomy. And this is, I found this really fascinating, but their research was on weight loss. They were using weight loss as a specific context to research this in, but this has been researched in other areas too. But basically if you get people together and have them coach each other and have one group of people just being generally autonomy supportive. Like you can do it. I'm here for you. There's many ways to be successful. You know, let me know if you need help, all that kind of stuff versus you are more directive. Like you can do this, but you're really going to have to watch this, this, and this. And I'm going to remind you of this every time we meet up and talk. Are you watching this? Are you watching that? They found that the, the more directive and more 
um, nitpicky approach produced no benefit in terms of the success rate. And the people that were just generally supportive, um, they lost more weight and kept it off longer. And so oh, wow. this is interesting yeah. because it's useful to know in the context of like being a teacher, when am I actually giving my student some kind of knowledge that they really need? Like they don't have access to this knowledge. Like I need to help them. Like maybe they just don't know. Like if, if if we do something this way and I give them a rationale, it's going to work better versus crossing the line where you're now just like badgering them to do something they, they already know about or that isn't actually that helpful. And I found this with students, especially my high school students, like some of them are getting into recording their own music and they're putting it on iTunes and stuff. I, I develop a very hands-off approach with them. I'm just like, I'm here. The lessons, I'm yep. here for you. Like yep. the lessons consist of like, let me hear your song. They they don't really at this point need to be put through like a more intense sequence of like um, we still go through the harmony sequence and we still go through rhythm sequences, but it's not as structured as I would uh, make it well, like once they start getting more advanced because they almost just start kind of guiding it. And, and I find it uh, I, I haven't found it helpful at those levels uh, where people are getting quite advanced to to say this is the regiment you need to be on. Yeah, well, and you need to do it this way. This is all intersecting with inference learning and generalization, mm. right? So you've got this. If you've got, if you're at that, if you're at the inference level of learning, the students are teaching themselves and you're guiding them. But if you're still at the rote level, all the discrimination levels up through composite synthesis kind of thing and you're mucking mm. around in between and among those uh, without the opportunity for the t students to guide them or to, to really teach them themselves then there's going to be uh, you know better better to have the structure uh, I think so there's I'm just saying that there's an intersection between the what we're talking about here with um, this theory and the levels are the the two types of learning but yeah yeah i agree um that, that's why i was interested to talk about it i mean like one really recent example of this was a student who i've had for years now and he's he's a great composer and a really amazing musician and it was recently uh, the past couple lessons he was asking me about secondary dominance, but he uses them all the time when he plays right but he wanted like a theoretical explanation for what they were and it was totally intrinsic he was like what is going on here why does this work and we it took like 15 minutes and i just you know explained this to him and it's locked in there now but i remember a year or two ago trying to get this like he was using them and i would like point little things out but he just like wasn't ready slash interested at all in that at that point but for some reason a couple of weeks ago he you know he's just soon as the lesson starts on Zoom, he's like, what is going on here? And he was just like, was really dying to to get to the bottom of it. And I remember in my own, um, in my own like musical upbringing, like I said, I had this great band teacher who's a classical guitarist. I didn't really take like one-on-one -on -one lessons with him. I was in a group guitar lesson. I would really just badger him whenever something was like burning. You know, it wasn't like every day I had to learn something new from him, but it just there would be something on my mind. I remember badgering him about like diminished chords and their inversions one day. I was like, so wait, any, like these, these chords are all the same, like these, these four. <laughs> and I mean, at that point, he's basically just like, yes, but you still felt supported that like someone knowledgeable could kind of help you like while you were kind of looking around for things. Yep. Yep. So, for sure. I think jazz is an interesting context to view this in because jazz you know in one lens it's the most it can be one of the most structured forms of music in terms of what in terms of what you need to know to be able to to do it there's a lot of uh and i don't mean theoretically i just mean like there's a lot of things you have to be able to audiate to intelligently even listen to the music so in in, in a sense it's a very structured type of curriculum of what you need to learn but often the people that go far in jazz they're really just all over the place in terms of what they're doing and what they're practicing. Like uh, I, I've read so many biographies at this point of great jazz musicians, but they, they're getting into a lot of different stuff, you know, and it's hard for me. I, I, I think we intuitively associate with jazz musicians, this, this sense of freedom in terms of what they're doing. Like improv is 
is a reflection of this, but both in terms of practicing, like I remember when we were talking to uh, Hal Galpert about this and, and when I was researching Galpert, I mean, he's, he's very much on the side of like, if you're bored when you're practicing, like <laughs> you should do something else. Like don't work on what you were just working on. Cause you know, it yeah. might be questionable. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if I mentioned this in a previous podcast, but I, I read the, the end of the autobiography Q. Quincy Jones. Mm -hmm. And so he's running around with the gangs of uh, South Chicago, or I forget what part of Chicago, but anyway, they're breaking into houses and doing their stock gang stuff or whatever. But apparently they broke into one and next door, uh, there was a piano and he got in there and, uh, and he started to play the piano and he just, his life changed forever kind of in that moment. Like mm -hmm. he found his aha moment and then all of a sudden he could be recognized for something that mm. was, you know, life fulfilling. Uh, whereas he was probably getting his social <laughs> skills from the wrong kind of kid kind of thing. Uh, I mean, that's it. That's up. interesting. I, I actually didn't think about that, but I, we know there's, there's research and I know this from other sources, not the self-determination theory research, but that kids who are engaged in different kinds of programs like sports and music tend to get less involved in gangs and stuff like that. Yeah. That's probably one of the reasons why. <laughs> um. <laughs> You're getting your social juice elsewhere. Um, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And then, and then you've, you've already got, you know, certain kinds of skills of, you know, trying to grow up too fast or having to grow up too quickly because of, bad situations yeah. or, or whatnot but i'm that, sure we're oversimplifying it to yeah. a large degree oh for but, sure for sure yeah. uh there's there's somebody on the tv last night that i saw um a poet and uh, he'd been in jail for carjacking and mm -hmm. uh he, he was like the last thing that would have ever happened to him he just was with the wrong guy and somebody didn't know and the, and the three of them got caught and he went jail for like eight or nine years or something oh, and it's nice. like he's one of the one of those kids it's like that that would just never happen to so when he got into jail he you know he found a way to get prisoners to pass him books and he started learning poetry and writing and and just and now he's you know a genius macarthur genius award oh wow um, kind of guy yeah it's a phenomenal story um mm -hmm. so i think it uh, this this thing can overlay across, of course, all professions, I suppose, or all. I mean, that's one of the benefits part. of the, the, the theory is there's just so many contexts you can look at this through. Um, I mean, you were talking about how we got into reading and poetry, but you know, just coming back to this, these, these three psychological needs that we have, this one need of competence though, is so interesting to look at through the lens of MLT because and this is the superpower of what Gordon br like brought to our attention is that audiation is actually the skill that we we were missing out on, and and it was the elephant in the room that we kind of pin the tail on the donkey. Now, without it being is... without it being distinguished, we're kind of fishing around. And when we teach audiation, it was accidental. Now there's a a real approach to you know to I stumbled on the word approach because it's it's always you know, it's just the theory. You can't say method or technique. <laughs> method or technique. <laughs> method or technique. I'm saying yeah. it. No. The whole um the whole um context for which uh for why teaching to help student help students audiate is mm -hmm. is the whole crux of the matter. And if you're just focused on on ears, 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 and then combining those ears with sulfur syllables, <laughs> and then on up the chain. Uh, sure. You're you're going to be effective, and the child's going to be effective. So you're you're helping them establish that competency piece. Like I can be, I see that I'm getting better. You know, from at least month to month, if not, you know, every two weeks. Like well, and kids, I think we see it. We see it a lot, like our students that um, take lessons with us, 
they can tell that they're audiating and they can tell like their parents and friends can often tell that they're audiating because I mean, I, I've had so many reports of someone's done a year or two of lessons somewhere else. And then, you know, within the first few months of us doing lessons together, like they're just playing so much stuff and they're kind of blown away. Um, but that's, that's just what happens when, when you have this competence side of things dialed in, I mean, people's skills grow and it coincides very nicely psychologically that it, it turns out to be, to feel very good, to honestly gain skill. And this is where you have to be kind of careful with this because uh, we're not talking about being socially recognized for being skillful. I'm not talking about that at all. I don't, I don't mean that someone else is saying, you're really good. And then you're like, well, now I can feel good about playing music. Now, I mean, like you actually are, yep. you know, somewhat getting into flow and or some kind of enjoyment of the process of learning. There's some kind of uh, feedback loop of satisfaction and interest that starts to come alive and competence. Um, although it, it's not always the only thing because we all know there's people with high music aptitude that are not interested in playing music. So it's not the only high skill level doesn't totally correlate with interest, but it's very correlated. It's yeah. very often, they, they very often come together. Yeah. Another thought, this uh, genius award winner, uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't like, now I'm a genius to him he says well, i've always been that genius what it is is the acknowledgement of all the people around me that supported my pursuit mm -hmm. and i mean that's a very that intuitively you know feels good to hear doesn't it <laughs> yeah so i mean i mean i i always had it and i had one of his kids you know he's got a 14 year old kid and his kid said, oh, really? yeah it, 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 he didn't change he's still my dad and he already knew what he was doing was was good and so the genius award wasn't for him it was it belonged to the community that i mean that is a really important part about uh, there's a couple of things in there that are amazing the, the the thing i wanted to bring out is the um the award like i'm sure he didn't mind it happening but it, it it's not like the award made everything suddenly meaningful that he was doing he already derived a sense of meaning and satisfaction and, and competence out of out of what he was doing and this is where you know the classic situation where someone someone enters a marathon and the marath the goal of being in a marathon organizes all their fitness training around that and then they do the marathon and then after it's done they feel the sense of hollowness because the the task is done now right yeah, but it's the ongoing you know we actually have this need for ongoing growth yes. and so acknowledging that you know, that's not going to go away is useful because then when you're done the marathon, it's not like winning or losing that individual marathon will make you feel necessarily anything. I mean, that, a lot of people feel hollow yeah, after they yeah. achieve huge that, goals. That piece of the future was fulfilled and now you need another new future to, you know, maybe mm -hmm. it's 10 marathons or maybe it's a whole different thing, but it's, it's the fact of putting yourself out there above you know, where you think you can be and going for it. This guy sitting in jail, like, I've got to overcome what I did, you know, what I took responsibility for, and did sure. everything he could uh, to uh, to make up. Because his mom, you know, it's like the, the moment you call your mom and say, I'm in jail, and I did it, you know? Like, yeah, it's taken responsibility right, you know, for it right off the bat, which gave him freedom to like, okay, now what am I going to use this that's the reality. What am I going to use this time it's for? It's interesting how intuitively we... I'm not saying that everything intuitive is correct. But I mean, when you tell that story and I hear about someone turning their life around from like that, you know, down... From that down, you know, they're as down as you can go. And then they turn their life around and it's a good experience for them and the community. I mean, we intuitively respond with like a feeling of like, yes, I like that. I like hearing that. Uh, it, that feels good. Um, I think that's why, you know, to bring this back into to music, um, I mean, I, I really think there's there's a necessity to have a good curriculum because there's such tight correlation between students achieving and feeling a sense of competence. And like I was saying before, there's a there's a huge difference between uh, autonomy and structure, right? So you can be very autonomy supportive while having a high structure, or you could be 
autonomy, supportive, well, chaos, you know, kids learn whatever they want, they play whatever they want. But I, I think you need to have a sense of, of what it is to design a good curriculum and how to implement the curriculum, um, which is like, I see as the, the Gordon project, it's so supportive towards teachers having autonomy because he's just saying, look, this is how this stuff works. Like now you got to go make your curriculum, but that can be like a monumental task for people to navigate. Um, and I've been very motivated by it, but I mean, when I think of myself, I'm probably abnormally interested in this compared to a lot of people. And I still find it to be like, wow, that's a task to like design a curriculum. And so I, you know, my heart goes out to people that, are just getting into MLT and trying to implement this. And I think you should, you should see, reach out to the community, Eric or me or whoever to help build a curriculum that you like teaching and that is effective. How else are your kids going to feel competent? And that's one of the legs, like, like continually, you know, moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there are step backs and, you know, three steps forward, two steps back often or sometimes or whatever. Yeah. But without a curriculum, you're not going to be able to support a child's competency. So the other two legs have to be there as well. But if you're going to make learning as easy, this is my thing, make learning as easy as you possibly can for somebody, you know. I totally agree. And I've said this before. I'm really not a big fan of these um, educational messages that I'm not, I'm not trying to single out um, Angela Duckworth, because I, I <laughs> liked her book Grit. I really liked yeah. the book Grit, but I think there's a there's an inappropriate way to interpret this idea of grit by basically irresponsibly just getting kids to do things that are way too hard for them and saying, "Well, you just have to try harder," even though like what I just asked you to do didn't make any sense. And and we have to be careful of that because I think what you said, Eric, there is so much research behind. Like there is a there is a sweet spot to confidence. We know that like eighty five ish percent, a little bit higher, a little bit lower. That's the amount of success people like having when they do a task. So if you that's, that's what video games are designed around. But it, it, you can even watch this yourself. Try to learn a song, and choose a repertoire that you can. Whether it's play four bars at a time or play the whole piece with eighty five percent accuracy, you'll tend to start being. Like getting into flow states more often that's what feels good yeah. and i think it's so important for people to know that like as an instrumental teacher one of the simplest things you can do when you're teaching a song by rote instrumentally is just teach a couple notes at a time when the wheels of the bus start falling off as in they they make mistakes ask them to do less of the melody and when they keep getting more than you know 85 percent just give them more instructions and make it harder. And they, it's crazy. Kids, kids will constantly just report like, how did that lesson go by so fast? Yep. Now the real answer is that you were in a flow state and I was trying to manipulate this the whole time. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's the power of competence is that it makes people feel good. And, and it, I'm a big fan of what you just said. I, I get very excited about that is that learning should feel maybe not effortless, but it should feel smooth. Like you should, yeah. be, I don't, I, I don't believe in this idea that learning is hard, but once you learn something, then you can get into well, a flow like state. The, you should be able to get into flow while you're learning. I like it. You know, the, the, the teaching the kids, look at that. The, here's the horizon. Here's where we're going to go. And it blows their mind. Like, I, that's way too far. And mm -hmm. then you come back and you see what we got done today. It's like, oh, we just took, you know, 10 more steps toward the horizon. I like giving kids both perspectives, you know, Wow, this is a little bit overwhelming. I can't learn all of that. And then there you find a, out yeah, that, that yeah. you know, so I, I have this duality going on at times where true, I like true. to, you know, like give kids the most ridiculous thing ever. Even my two and three year olds, I'll do a chant, you know, you know, after they've done ba, 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 you know, and I do a rhythm like that. And, and they're not supposed to respond to it, they're just supposed to laugh. And when they do, or their parents sure. are supposed to laugh, yeah. or there's occasionally a parent will try. And but you did, but you're doing something in there that's quite <laughs> skillful in terms of th there's there's humor, but the student also knows that what you're getting them to do is ridiculous, and yes. they're probably if they try it, doing it with a bit of a playful spirit. They're not feeling like, well, if I don't sing exactly no, what you're no, saying, I'm less of a musician, right? Yeah, and I think it's important to, to kind of 
separate that. It's funny when I say I'm going to, you know, to tell the parent, I'm going to, sh- I'll tell you how to get your kid to be quiet is you give them one thing, one, that one thing that's a little bit <laughs> too difficult for them. So it's a two beat pattern they can do. But when I say ba, 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 my res- the response I get, they don't even try. That's the whole thing. They just don't even try. Sure. And occasionally there's a brave kid that, that tries and, and, you know, and, and can't do it. And then rarely there's a kid that, that nails it. And it's like, oh, you're, you're a year ahead of, <laughs> of yourself. Yeah. You know, or, or typ- and I think that's a, a typical three-year-old or four or two. That's an important part of the, the lesson environment that you have. You know, it's supportive in, in the sense you you've kind of installed this idea in your students minds that like i can take chances in mr eric's class and my like ego is not on the line you know like i can i can i can kind of throw some stuff around and see what happens and and i can have fun with it and i think yeah that's a lot easier said than done because you can say that to people like oh you can try and nothing bad will happen but they actually have to believe it and yeah, feel it yeah. what, in the class when, it, when the child starts to turn toward their mom, you know, or puts their head in their lap, you know, that's no, and I don't want to try. I, I, and I, I, you don't have to go. <laughs> it's no reason. You don't have to take a turn. You don't want to turn. Sure. And that's fine. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, you can use your words and say, no, thank you. <laughs> the next, you know. Yeah. It, you know, if, if, I want, if that's something I want to, it's a grumpy. I always thing. leave it. I always leave the option of, um, like when I first meet students and we haven't known each other for quite a while, and they're not there to take singing lessons, which is where I'm going with this. I'm not going to force them to sing on the spot with me because if you have a group class, one of the ways you can get around this is make people comfortable singing in a group first, so they're not singled out, and then later on, once they're comfortable singing, you can ask them to sing in solo, whether yep. it's tonal pattern or whatever. But in in a one on one lesson. You can't necessarily do that, so you have to find workarounds to make yep. them feel comfortable. And I, I really don't, for the long term benefit of the student, I, I I've never make someone sing when they're uncomfortable with it. I'll first have them start humming while they play their instrument, and they get into that. And eventually, it doesn't take long; they'll get yeah. into it. And they'll also see me just kind of go for it. We've we'll talked it. about using, you know, the instrument as the as the um as the voice, you know, as yeah. The, Using that, I mean, for, using the instrument for our oral, using the instrument. This is a topic we haven't dedicated an episode towards. I'm not sure if it warrants a full episode, but you can learn to audiate without singing. And uh, I am convinced of this because I did. I never sang when I was younger. I just listened, 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 and then I played instruments. And I could, I could sing. So what's interesting is like the students that I've done this with um, on piano and guitar some of the some of the ways we learn things by ear or the little exercises I'll do where I change it from major to minor, they are able to sing without lessons. Like my one of my students' mom, uh, who had uh, she commented on this, he had been taking lessons with me for a couple of years and I was doing MLT stuff with him, uh, but kind of being not very intense about the singing aspect of it because I could tell he wasn't very into it. He can really sing now. Like the kid can really sing. And, yeah. and it's just, that's the, that's the the testament to how powerful audiation is, is that uh, not that singing lessons wouldn't help this kid getting better technically, but I, I give this kid no technical advice for singing lessons. I just helped his audiation and he can sing really well. Yeah. The, yeah. the, there's an issue for the person that's doing the assessment or evaluation, whether the kid knows when he's in tune or not, if they're only playing the instrument easier yeah. to do when they're on a violin you know, it's like that's had a tune, this is in tune, the kid might not be audiating. Or it's a technical right. matter and, and they're just not haven't quite mastered getting their finger down at the right spot right away. Mm-hmm. Um, even some you know, my my niece is going to Miami uh mm-hmm. to play for all, all these quartets and concertos and it's just gonna be a, a, a whole swimming pool full of great musicians you know and i'm watching her practice while we're on vacation and you know it's it's just really cool watching and and some of the basic things she'll you know do is play out of tune 
here and there, but then the question is how quickly you correct it or learning when she stops and all that. But, but what's going to happen is, um, is that, you know, you, she's going to have this glorious experience down there and she's, and she's just going to get better from all the teaching around it. I lost my train of thought in the middle of that somewhere, but, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's like a, uh, yet a noticeable, you know, so that's somebody that's really good. It's really at a high level. And she's still doing the basic things, like not quite getting her finger in the right spot at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, which is like, how do you not, how do you get that down to like 99.99% accuracy instead of 98 or, yeah. or, or higher, which was where she was at. Um, and and to, to have her sing, which I know she can, mm -hmm. uh, you can tell, right? If if you had her sing it, would she would her fingers fall suit? Or again, with an instrument like the guitar or the fret or the piano, which the strings are already tuned or whatever. So uh, yeah, putting your I fingers mean, down, you might not know that they're imitating or audiating. That's basically yeah. What this I was is saying. a I, I would. I think it's this is worth going down this rabbit hole just for a minute because this this idea of like when a student's playing an instrument that is like a piano or a guitar that's a guitar that's in tune uh, and has properly done intonation, how do you know when the student's imitating or um, audiating just by playing? So you're not asking them to sing stuff, and right? I, well, in creativity and improvisation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily about in tune, but it's about your understanding of harmonic functions which to me if you understand harmonic functions intonation is is yeah. so much easier than if you just know 100 melodies the harmonic yeah, functions I mean, you get four or five harmonic functions you're done <laughs> yeah pretty much I mean, even uh, yeah if, if you can get a lot of students if you just get them to one four five i mean miracles start happening right yeah. <laughs> but uh you know, something I notice when I start my practice sessions, like when I'm when I'm kind of working classical guitar pieces, I'll tune my guitar and then I'll go start playing a piece that's in D. I will retune it a little bit because I don't like the yeah. the my ear does not like the equal temperament yeah. when I'm in a certain key. Yeah. But I don't even really notice I'm doing this at first. I'll just um I'll just like the G string needs to be like a little more this way. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's something I've noticed students do as well. Uh, which is interesting. And I have actually have a student who has an upright piano right now and he hasn't, they haven't tuned it for a little bit. And there's a key on this piano that drives this kid insane because it's, it's not, uh, I think one of the strings or two of the strings are out of tune with the other one. So yeah. this like one E note on his piano is just like really out there and it, yeah. you know, it gets under his skin. It's fun to hear people report on that. Yeah. Yeah. No, they, you know, they're, they're they are audiating. So yeah, well, that's a good rabbit hole. Maybe we can develop a, episode for that uh, we might be biased too here because we're not string players so i think there's a lot that can be said about how mlt can to a large degree take away the obsession string have players have with working on intonation air quote with methods that don't make any sense because uh, a lot of the higher level string players i've i've met they they basically just get you to sing the resting tone and sing the song yeah. I mean that's their that's their university level strategy. Yeah, but well, often that's... often things like using a tuner just it doesn't work. No, no, helpful. no. You play. Here's what you do: you play with a, a small ensemble, a trio, or quartet, quintet. You yeah. Play. That's that's the one thing missing in instrumental music that I'll I'll stand up and, and shout from the rooftops a hundred times. Mm -hmm. That that's much more uh, uh, effective. Uh, it, it, it's more difficult to play in a quartet than a band. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you're very exposed in the quartet. Yes, and and, and yet you've got to in, in tune and dance with with everybody. It's not like you can, you know, you've yeah. got you, you've got the rhythmic and the the, the meter parameters, the context. There's that you a have to me mesh with the group, and then your intonation has to mesh with the group. So. Um, yeah i mean speaking of intonation like there's a there's this perlman story of of uh you know he's just playing this amazing concerto 
And then he finishes and he goes to tune his violin and the audience starts laughing because like the strings on his violin are really out of tune. But he was just playing a second ago and everything sounded fine. And what what this means is that this guy's adjusting his intonation on the fly, like to that <laughs> level. <laughs> because, you know, he made it this far into the piece and he didn't have time to retune the violins, but he's able to on the fly adjust. And I mean, it's, it's, it's cool to hear that because I mean, what this points at for a violin player is that the violin players are not necessarily gaining the skill of, of, audiating something and then knowing exactly what to, where to put their fingers what they're actually doing is they're putting their they're fingers audiating. where they're audiating where they're audiating they're, and they're able to make a little adjustments on the fly if the strings out of tune which is fingers of the much slave, different skill set fingers are the slave of the ear as opposed to the other way around yeah i mean yeah hopefully hopefully you know it's funny it's it's funny like I, i'll give this analogy to students where in the beginning of piano lessons i'm extremely relaxed about fingerings you know, I'm like, let's try only pinky, no pinky, only <laughs> pinky and index. Like, it's just a game. I don't really care what fingers they use at a certain point until they can audiate well. But um, it, it's it's funny telling them, like, when you talk, you're not really obsessed with what your lips are doing. Like, that's the wrong thing to occupy your attention with, like how the mechanics of your lips and your mouth work. Yeah. That is essentially exactly what we do as instrumentalists. We start obsessing you're, you're over... You're driving technique. piano teachers crazy right now because it helps relax the hand to have better fingering. You know, like, there's so much benefit yeah. to... At a certain point, right? Oh, I, yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I agree. But, you know, I, I think at a certain point... If you have a half an hour with a student once a week, what are your educational goals? Mine are audiation first. I basically, I'd rather have someone play with their index finger all year and be a great audiator than spend 10 minutes of the lesson talking about technique. It's not, it's not a, uh, they're not mutually ex uh, exclusive. Like you can actually work on both at, at the same time. But I do think in a lot of circumstances for piano and guitar, technique is really kind of blocking people's development with yeah, their audiation the, there's a way to do it that's more supportive some, of audiation. some of the arguments i see on facebook over which is the right fingering for this passage the, uh, but this comes back to the autonomy support thing we we're just talking about i mean what is more what feels better to hear as a student like well there's a bunch of different fingerings you could use here i don't agree with the one the composer chose here's what i recommend but i encourage you to explore the different options and see what works best for you versus no no hell will freeze over if you don't use this certain fingering and i mean i was working on this barrios piece and barrios was a you know one of the best classical guitarists that ever lived and, and definitely one of the best uh, classical guitar composers and i disagree with some of his fingerings i it just some of the things he suggests is i'm just like mm, i I don't know if our hands are just different, but like I'm not open yeah, to what yeah, you just did. Yeah. But yeah. So these all all boiled down back to what we were talking about, how to help improve gradually and continuously so that the so that the student is progressing, so they have some competency, right? And and the other is that they have some social engagement. Mm -hmm. which so, i think is one of the reasons the suzuki method works well when it does work is that it's super social it's really yeah. aimed around that yeah and the and the third one autonomy is the autonomy having having students buy into what's happening and they're not uh mutually exclusive because because a, a child will buy in if they see that they're learning and the autonomy thesis is, uh, I, you know, I, I just love playing with the, with the psychology of my students because it, 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 the more we laugh, the, it seems like the better we're learning. Um, and I'm goofy, but it, it makes it comfortable for them to just be them. Mm -hmm. And that's who I am with them. And so it, it's, you know, and it and it goes both ways in the, with the class. If I'm feeling supported or encouraged by the students, like do that again. I want to hear that song again. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's simple that's things one thing like I think that. Is... It's like I'm glad you like that song, but we're moving on. Or I'm glad you like that song. We'll do it again next week. I'm glad you like that song. Or uh, let's do it the wrong way. Or uh, you know, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Uh, or you know, or here it is again. I just play it again. It's like. 
and then I sing the roots and not the melody and then or whatever it's like I just deepen yeah. it mm -hmm. yeah I mean you're and you're at a point with your own teaching Eric where um you've mastered the skills to to execute this stuff where you can largely make these choices on the fly and I'm sure that's a huge reason you know you have this kind of aspect of choice into what you do next and I'm sure that's a reason why, oh I hate uh, I hate I hate planning <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah. i have a i like i i want to make sure i know what i did the last couple weeks and i want to know what i'm doing the next the next couple weeks but every song there's there's nothing wrong with you know the same song for six weeks if they want it so the, this is one of the reasons why the, in terms of tracking lessons and planning um, the system that i use for one-on-one -on -one teaching is i just have an evernote file with every student and i just write the date and i write the songs we worked on I yeah. I don't I I don't write anything more detailed than that because yeah. I found that putting more structure into like we're yeah. gonna do this for this long we're gonna do this so it 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 just made it it wasn't increasing it, the benefits it falls apart and I I am a improviser at, at heart and I improvise in the classroom mm -hmm. with my teaching so I don't like the structure I have and I have I have the same structure every week in terms of the sequence of activities that I do so the kids are comfortable because two and three year olds love structure. Everybody likes good structure. Yeah. And I think actually that's one of the biggest like confusions that come around self-determination theory. And I know even the authors, uh, Richard Ryan and Edward Desi uh, or DC, they've talked a lot about that, that autonomy does not mean independence and it does not mean freedom from structure, which people are often confused about. So they, they often think, well, just let people do things on their own however they want. That's not really educationally going to help people. And I've harped on this a lot in on these podcasts is that I'm a little skeptical about pure discovery learning because like, you know, yeah. how many of your students are going to discover what a four chord is on their own? I mean, <laughs> I don't know, probably not many, um, but there is a place for structure, but um, I'm always skeptical about implementing structure. You know, like I better have a good reason for like, we talked about doing LSAs at the start. That might be a good, heuristic to start with as a teacher but i'm always skeptical about kind of forcing myself to do something a certain way it it better produce pretty insane benefits um because the option of of letting yourself have more choice around it um is is going to be really skillful so if, you, if you're going to try to constrain something there must be a good reason to do so well i think we've uh <laughs> We kicked that horse a little bit, but that's If you're good. interested, so if you are interested in reading more about self-determination theory, I believe the website is selfdeterminationtheory.org. The creators of the theory, Richard Ryan and Edward DC, really both great guys. And you, and you can actually see, like, I've watched a lot of Richard Ryan's stuff recently. You can see he's just, he's he seems very well, like, in terms of a very intelligent guy, very relaxed, very loose. But I, I highly recommend uh, looking into that more all right sweet well all righty good one till next time